In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mother of us all. Amen. Please be seated. It is Trinity Sunday. So, who wants to take a stab at explaining the Trinity for me? <laughs> no one? What? Uh, Trinity Sunday, when I was uh, working at a church where we had a regular influx of seminary interns um, down by the University of Chicago from the Divinity School and the other seminaries down there, Trinity Sunday became colloquially known as Seminarian Intern Sunday because we would make them preach on this day. If someone's going to commit heresy, it's going to be them. <laughs> it's for reasons like that, that there are two images of God that I have always struggled with. One is indeed the Trinity, which we celebrate today. The image of God three in one, three persons, one nature, etc., etc. One of the reasons I have struggled with it is maybe something um, you can relate to is that it's downright confusing. What do we mean? It's involved in complicated metaphysics that require reading really sophisticated like second and third century philosophy. Does that seem like something that we need to do in order to understand what Jesus was saying to people who couldn't even read in their own language? Is that the revelation? Is that the good news to have a God that is like that? It's also a little bit embarrassing, I think, confessing the Trinity. Let's be honest, right? If we say that we are part of the tradition of Israel, we are siblings with Jewish people, we are siblings with Muslims who confess one God, it's a little bit embarrassing to say, well, but God is also three. And I know they're often very polite to us, but I can't help but think that they think we're secret polytheists, right? No, we're not so secret, Susan says, right? <laughs> what are they doing over there in that church? Trinity, what are they talking about? The Trinity, I think, also can feel a little impersonal, right? For that same sort of reason. It's this kind of theological abstraction. It's akin to people debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, right? Is there, what is the relationship we can have to the Trinity? What is salvific? What is changing about our lives when we confess that God is three and one? So that's one image of God that I've always struggled with. But let me tell you about another one. And I'll get to why it's relevant to the Trinity as well. The other is sort of the image that we had in the Isaiah reading, the image that's evoked also in the hymn we just sang, the canticle we just sang. It's, I think, probably the default image we all carry, or almost all of us carry, better or worse, about what God looks like. Or if you say the word God, what's the image that pops into your mind? And it's the God who is the old white guy on a throne. Let me be clear, there is nothing wrong with old white guys. I'll do you one better. I plan on becoming one myself. So maybe I'm mostly there already. The problem I have had is the old white guy on a throne, right? We might even say that this country fought a whole revolution about old white guys on thrones, and maybe that's not such a good idea anymore. And if it's true of how we organize ourselves as a community, if it's true of how we think politics should go, if we are really believers in democracy, and consensus and relationship that is involved in governing ourselves through these kinds of processes, doesn't that sit uncomfortably with also worshiping a God who rules the universe by himself like a king, or even worse, like a dictator? So, one thing happened to me that kind of brought these two images of God together in a way that was transformative for me. The church I was attending before I was ordained, 
uh, called a new associate rector, fresh out of seminary, really dynamic, cool guy. And the first Sunday that he gets up to preach, he starts in the same way that might be familiar to you and says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, mother of us all. I got that from him. And so immediately after the service, I had two questions for him. First, who is mother of us all? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it the whole Trinity? And he sort of shrugged like, I don't know. What do you think, right? Maybe both. Maybe one and then the other. Who knows? So my second question for him is, where did you get this from? Where did you get this formula from? And he said, I picked it up in seminary. Why? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of like the sound of it, and so I started using it. But the answer, the real answer to where he got it from, and he got it from general, and general, I think folks at General Seminary probably got it from this sort of thing, from today's very gospel. When Jesus, early in his ministry, in the nighttime, is met by this Pharisee named Nicodemus, asking him, where, why, how are you able to do these things? Where have you come from? And Jesus starts talking about being born from above, and being born anew, and being born of water and the spirits. And suddenly, this initial revelation of the Holy Spirit, and therefore the revelation of the Trinity, then becomes a different way of thinking about God. Not God, who is the old white guy sitting on the throne, but God, who is birth giver. God, who is mother. God, who is midwife. This isn't me being, you know, a hippie, woke millennial. <laughs> it's in the Bible, folks, right? We can't talk about being born again, being born anew, being born from above, without then also thinking of God who is giving birth to us, and God who is making that birth possible. And the more I started to think about that, the more I started thinking about where does the Trinity start popping up a little bit in Scripture, the more I've found is that every time it happens, every time we hear a little bit about these relationships between God the Father and God the Son, or God the Son and the Holy Spirit, or the Father and the Holy Spirit, these initial things that are happening in the Gospels and in Paul's letters, the more I realized that there is an abundance of images of God that are starting to emerge for Christians when they start thinking about the Trinity. Ma masculine images, feminine images, images of God as warrior, images of God as healer, and abundance. The Trinity gets us back to the mystery of God, so that when the name God is invoked in our minds, we don't just go to that one image of the old white guy sitting on a throne. And if we even think of a throne, maybe we start thinking about other people who might better be placed on that throne for a while. In the scriptures, the Trinity opens up these fluid and multifaceted and mysterious and creative ways of talking about the divine. It opens up to the magnificent mystery of God and gives us language that we might not yet understand but that we like the sound of. Because I'll let you in a little secret, that's the history of the doctrine of the Trinity itself. The church started using the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before it had any sense of what that meant. And you know when we started using it? For baptism. And at the end of the day, during all the controversies around the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, and it was a tough fight and it split a lot of people apart. At the end of the day, the argument that always seemed to win 
is that we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so if we've been baptized in the Trinity, shouldn't we also believe that the Trinity is true? We liked the sound of it before we understood what it meant. We're still figuring out what it means. And one other thing I'd say about the Trinity is that the more we realize what the Trinity means, this equality of three persons, equal in divinity, equal in power, equal in majesty, equally worthy of worship, the more that pulls against that old white guy, that old white guy on the throne, image of God. Why? Because the Trinity is not the image of a dictator ruling the universe. The Trinity is an image of community. It's an image of relationship. It's an image of love. The Trinity, the confession of the Trinity, is the confession that relationship is the nature of God. Mutuality is a relationship, is the nature of God. And people who want always to kind of make God the Father like just a little bit, a little bit more equal than the other two are always, I think, trying to wrestle from that a God who sits on the throne because we kind of want one person to really be in charge. And the challenge instead is to think of a universe that doesn't quite work like that a universe that's ruled by the relationship of the three in unity, a unity of perfect relationship. So, two takeaways for you today. First, you ever get in a conversation about the Trinity again? Somebody asks you, well, explain it to me. What are you talking about? First, you have my permission to give what we will call now the Episcopalian shrug. <laughs> Let's practice it real quick. Like, on the count of three, I want you to go like this, all right? <laughs> One, two, three. Mm. <laughs> the, the noise helps. Mm. Yeah. The shrug is, is fine, right? We like the sound of it. We're intuiting something is true about it. Don't ask us to fully explain it. It's working for us for now. Second takeaway. Second takeaway. So why, really, if they press you, why really is the Trinity important? It is because we've had enough of dictators. We've had enough of one person coming in, trying to be in charge, and ruling over us with overwhelming strength and violence and power, telling us what to do. It doesn't work on the human level, and I'm convinced that Jesus bit by bit revealed that it doesn't work on the divine level either. That's not the nature of God. The Trinity grounds us in the reality that God is relationship. And it's a relationship that we are invited to as well. Amen. Amen.